How many times can you say that a video game has really touched you? And what I mean by this is how many times has a game seriously connected with you on an emotional level? How many times has a game truly changed the way you think, act and feel towards everyday life and how many times can this really occur when playing video games? One of, if not my favourite games emotionally touched me in this way, changed me in a way that I can't even explain. A game so bizarre, strange and confusing that I really had to take a step back. Take a step back and acknowledge all of the events in the past, present and future. Events that I had experienced through playing this game. Meeting characters who I had the pleasure and displeasure of interacting with. Meanwhile, coming across sinister creatures that roam the desolate and yet beautiful landscapes. This is a game like none other. A game that I've put many hours into as I've delivered packages and parcels to neighbouring societies. Yes, today I am talking about Hideo Kojima's masterpiece, Death Stranding. Although Hideo Kojima was working at Konami for quite some time before he created Death Stranding, Kojima was let go from Konami, with the company stating that he was an independent video game developer, meaning although he had worked with Konami for so long, he wasn't really an employee, instead just someone they brought in to help make games. After a messy breakup between Kojima and Konami in Metal Gear Solid V The Phantom Pain, Konami wiped all references to Hideo Kojima to make it as if he never even helped with the game. Even though this is completely untrue as Kojima even won an award for his role in the development of Metal Gear Solid 5 at the Game Awards. But in spite and due to legality issues, Kojima was not allowed to collect his award, and so the voice actor for Solid Snake collected it on Kojima's behalf. Which fans of Kojima's work were outraged that Konami would do such a scandalous thing. Hideo Kojima later went to create his own company called Kojima Productions, where he signed a deal with Sony to create a brand new game which would eventually become Death Stranding. And with the promises of using photogrammetry and motion capture, as well as big stars such as Troy Baker, Norman Reedus, Ellie O'Brien, Mads Mikkelsen, Guillermo del Toro, as well as Lei Seydoux, including many others, and would eventually reveal Death Stranding's first trailer in 2016. Through various interactions with many other characters in Death Stranding, we learn that there have been at least five other mass extinctions before the game has even taken place, wiping out all other eras of life on Earth. And for those who are uninformed, a mass extinction causes the end of life as we know it, killing off all previous life but therefore allowing new life to grow. These mass extinctions are caused by extinction entities which make the events of a mass extinction occur. The sixth mass extinction is starting to occur during the events of the game, unknown to the protagonist and many other characters. This is shown from the very start of the game. A Death Stranding has occurred previous to the game's events, causing rain to change to timefall rain and beach things, commonly referred to as BTs to our cast of characters, to occur. Causing void outs and cataclysmic explosions, as well as a new Kyrelian particle to form. When Sam Porter, our protagonist, is helping deliver a body to a crematorium, an influx of beached things arrive. But when the timefall rain starts to pour down, unearthly things start to happen. Time Fall causes temporal acceleration, or aging for short. One of the characters is taken by a group of BTs before being shot by the other courier. The final courier is then lifted into the air as his gun drops to the ground, covered in a mysterious black oil. Unable to reach his gun, the courier attempts to stab himself to death, but is not fast enough as he is swept away. Meanwhile, a massive BT entity arrives. We see a mysterious figure clad in black with a gold skull mask on his face, much like the body that was being transferred. He points us to the massive BT, enticing us to believe that he is the one controlling all the BTs surrounding us. 
Eventually, the giant BT consumes the last courier and causes another void out. And Sam Porter is killed in the process, or so we are led to believe. This is where the game starts off to introduce the player to the world of Death Stranding, as you have awoken to find yourself on a beach. The title card is shown and you are finally ready to travel through the treacherous mountains, enemy territories, caverns and more, which leads us perfectly onto my next topic. Your role in Death Stranding is to connect the United Cities of America using the Chiral Network as instructed by Armalee, your sister. By doing this, everyone in America will be able to share information of all kinds, such as research into the Death Stranding and how it occurred, as well as spreading information on Timefall Rain, as well as many other ways to reconnect people in the world. Whilst reconnecting America through the Chiral Network, you may have to convince civilians that they need the Chiral Network in order to be reunited with everyone else. But some people may ask you to perform a specific task for them before joining the network, such as delivering packages or collecting a specific item for them. For example, a camera, some supplies, or even delivering letters to another civilian. Your tasks may seem menial in Death Stranding, but trust me, you do have a bigger role, you just don't know it yet. On your journeys, you will meet various characters who will help guide you towards the end of the story. Characters like Mama, Deadman, Hartman, and Fragile, who we will get onto later. All of these characters help guide you towards your end goals, which is to reconnect everyone to the Chiral Network, but also to return Armley from the clutches of Higgs and his team of terrorists who have taken her hostage. Which is why you only see holograms of Armley rather than actually physically seeing her. The mass amounts of Chirelium in the atmosphere can cause void outs, and in fact can also cause Chirelium storms, which later on in the story Sam is thrust into after throwing a bomb and disposing of it. We find out that the bomb was actually given to us by Higgs in disguise. We are then sucked into a storm and Sam finds himself in some rendition of World War 1, which we later find out is Clifford Unger's beach. This is actually where we first meet Clifford Unger who is trying to steal Sam's BB or loot. Sam comes across Clifford many times as the player may recognise him from BB's flashback sequences. Sam is often teleported to Clifford's beaches many times throughout the game. Clifford's beaches represent his anger and frustration after his baby was stolen to help create the BB project when he was still in the realm of the living. After reconnecting most of America, Sam has started pushing through an ocean of that mysterious black liquid. And when he gets to the other side, Sam has done it. He has finally reconnected America and your job is done meaning that that is the end of Death Stranding. Now, of course, I am only joking, you still have a good couple of hours of the game left, I just really hope I got you there. And to be honest, I was bewildered at this revelation too. When Sam awakens, he sees Higgs and they race to get to Armalee first. Not really fair, since Higgs can teleport through the use of the beach, but we'll let it slide. Getting to Armalee is a struggle, with more parkour in the game than we have ever seen. When Sam reaches Armalee, Higgs already has his power over her and causes a giant BT similar to the one we saw at the start of the game. When the giant BT has been destroyed by Sam, Higgs takes Armalee to the beach. No, not that kind of beach. With the help of Fragile, you can teleport to that beach, and after a long game of cat and mouse with Higgs, it all boils down to a Street Fighter battle of all things. Yes, the HUD and all. Somehow this game just gets weirder every time something new happens. But after this final battle between Sam and Higgs, Sam does come out victorious. Fragile wishes to deal with Higgs and presumably and mercilessly kills him, but it is left ambiguous to the player until later on. Armalee reveals that she has been lying to Sam this entire time, but before Sam could get any details after a Mario reference, Clifford Unger appears at the exact same beach alongside Bridget Strand and Die Hardman. Clifford recognises Die Hardman and demands his BB, and then Bridget Strand points to Sam and Armalee pushes Sam off a cliff, only to awaken in a private room. Only to now discover that he has to travel east, towards the first area of the game. On Sam's travels, he is sucked into a chiral storm, where he encounters Clifford Unger for the last and final time. 
Sam comes to the revelation that Clifford Unger is not trying to steal Lou as we presumed that that BB was his child. But in fact, we find out that Sam is actually the baby of Clifford Unger, and the baby that Clifford has been speaking to in the flashbacks. And in fact, Clifford Unger was a highly regarded soldier, and Di Hardman was given his name because of Clifford Unger's reluctance to let him die on the battlefield. And in return, Di Hardman tried to help Clifford get his baby back from the BB project. After having to kill his wife, Clifford tries escaping with Sam as a child, but is caught. Sadly, Di Hardman is ordered to kill Clifford, but at the time also kills Sam as a baby in the process. It is only later that we find out that your adopted mother resurrected you, which is the reason for Sam's nasty scar on his chest and also the fact that he can repatriate, which means that he can come back to life after death. Sam travels to the beach one final time, and this time is to confront Amelie. This is where Sam finds out that Amelie and Bridget are actually one in the same, a body and a soul. Sam finds out that Amelie is the sixth extinction entity, as the extinction has already begun. The player is given the option to kill Amelie and prevent the next mass extinction, or just to let it happen. Now this is a false choice, as if you try and shoot Amelie, your bullets do nothing and you will actually witness the next extinction. This will then lead you to a continue screen, meaning that you chose the wrong choice? Only by hugging Amelie can you delay the sixth mass extinction. Amelie realises it's the connection between people that makes life so unique, especially her bond with Sam. Meanwhile, on the beach, Amelie tells Sam her life story whilst recapping some of the game's events. Due to the hematic round in Di Hardman's revolver, which is actually Sam's blood put into a bullet, and is the same gun that Sam uses to try and kill Amelie, Deadman, Fragile, Hartman, and Lochner manage to pull Sam from the beach, bringing him back to the normal realm of the living. Di Hardman actually becomes the President of the United Cities of America and performs a speech which Sam doesn't necessarily like as it paints him as a hero. Fragile's company, Fragile Express, becomes the first certified delivery company under Di Hardman's new presidency, and Fragile offers Sam a job, and yet Sam refuses, preferring to be a lone wanderer instead. It is here where we find out if Fragile killed Higgs or not, to roam the beach for all eternity or to die by her hand, but he chose death. Deadman tells Sam that his BB Lou is on the verge of death and that Lou must be incinerated in case of another void out. Deadman does remark that Sam could try and see if Lou would survive outside of the BB pod, but it would be a violation to the United Cities of America. Deadman then proceeds to remove Sam's UCA cufflinks, giving him the chance to walk away and be untraceable to the UCA. And when Sam reaches the incinerator facility, Sam places down Lou and his cufflinks on the incinerator. But at the last minute, Sam picks up Lou, leaving his cufflinks to melt away, leaving him untraceable. Sam takes Lou out of her pod, trying to help her survive outside of the pod. And after a brief scare of Lou dying, Lou actually survives. And since Sam is no longer connected to the UCA, we presume that they will have a great life as father and daughter. The world of Death Stranding is one of true beauty, but unfortunately my video capture can't even show that off, mainly due to the compression, so I do apologise if what I'm saying doesn't link up directly to my gameplay. When playing Death Stranding, the world looks stunning, and honestly I'd say it's some of the best graphics I've seen in all of the video games that I have ever played. And although Death Stranding is set in America, the world looks to be more inspired by the beautiful country of Iceland. Traversing Death Stranding's interpretation of America was always something I loved to do when playing the game. It just had an aura about it, you know? I feel like I was truly immersed into the world and its environment, encapsulated into its stunning green grass intertwined with the beautifully flowing rivers, as well as the broken but still standing buildings. Hideo Kojima's world design certainly stands out here and it is wonderful. 
I'm not too sure why, but I feel like the colours for the textures of grass, snow and a multitude of other environmental objects have been brightened up a bit more than how they would normally appear in real life. It certainly makes the world and all of its aspects to offer pop a bit more which I certainly have no problem with. I'm not saying that the world doesn't look naturalistic in its presentation, because it does, but the slight tweaks to the overall aesthetic just give it a more luxurious vibe to me. And it's really frustrating that the words that I'm saying can't even describe how much I love the environments. There's just something about the world that just gives me goosebumps whenever I traverse a hill, a mountain, or even a ravine. Some areas in Death Stranding really do convey and show how much life has been stripped back from this interpretation of America. Most buildings you see will be black or grey, lost to time in a world where even dying isn't even the end of your existence. There is a clear distinction between buildings and the world. The ones ravaged by timefall are broken, very broken, yet cities are still standing tall and yet still feel just as dead as the frail towers that we see in game. Some of Death Stranding's story is even told through its world, although not directly because that would be too easy for us. And in Death Stranding you can gather some history of the world not only through broken buildings but also through the scarce amounts of actual towns and civilizations. Everyone just like the world is so disconnected. People are scared and this is represented in the second area of the game, where the grounds lay bare with only rubbles and stones left on the ground. Not even a single blade of grass can pierce through the stone. Just like how no one can break free from the occurrence of the Death Stranding. I truly love the open world of Death Stranding. It's so stripped back to the core that it makes me feel just as alone as the protagonist Sam Porter does. I honestly feel like Death Stranding has one of, if not the most beautiful game worlds that I have ever played. Graphically, Death Stranding looks fantastic and I can't wait to relive the world of Death Stranding on the newer PlayStation 5 hardware. The enemies in Death Stranding are fairly unique as I haven't really seen any enemies like these specific enemies in other games that you can interact with in such an amazing way. You basically have three types of enemies in this open world, such as mules, BTs and giant BTs. Now me saying two different types of BTs may sound like a cop out, but trust me they are very different in the way they interact with the player, as well as the way they interact with the environment that surrounds you at the time. Mules are your standard enemies in the game, your generic foot soldiers to put it plainly. They will only attack you if they scan you, as in certain areas of the world they have sensors that can detect you. There is a way for the player to combat the scan using Sam's own scanner thanks to BB at the same time to count out the mule scan and therefore you will be undetectable. Well, if you get your timing right of course. But mules do pack a deadly punch. When running or in a vehicle they will throw electric staffs at you and if you're on foot they can knock your cargo off your back leaving you open for an attack while trying to reclaim them. But if you're in a vehicle those staffs can disable your vehicle from moving for a few seconds. Mules also reside around camps. Now these camps have a ton of cargo which can be used to build bridges and roads, but are also not the safest place to be. And so there's a risk reward system in place here. You can run the risk of trying to get more valuable cargo, but at the expense of losing some of your own. We also have our regular BTs. These enemies can generally be encountered in high Kyrelium areas. Generally your BB can sense them and when Lou does, Sam will need to hold his breath to avoid detection. But if Sam can't hold his breath for any longer, he will become easily detectable to the BTs. And this is one of the most annoying parts of this game, seriously. When detected, the BTs can try and grab you, which can be evaded, but if you run out of stamina, you'll be grabbed underground and, oof, you will be in for a surprise to what your next enemy will be. After being dragged underground, your surrounding area will be covered in that mysterious black oil and you will be greeted by a bigger octopus-like BT. These BTs can be deadly if you are not well prepared, as if your weapon is not up to par or you don't have enough ammo, you may have 
have a tougher time than most. Fighting these iterations of BTs may prove to be a challenge, especially if you run out of ammo or hermetic grenades, which are the most powerful against these BTs. But don't worry, if you run out of ammo in your fight, generally you can find new guns or grenades to aid you in your fight, as players can actually give you more ammo, which we will get onto a bit later on in the video. This feature can really help you out in a pinch, especially if you can no longer damage the enemy. One thing that I've noticed in Death Stranding is that the game discourages smaller encounters, but encourages big ones. This allows players to go head first and face the biggest fear in the game. And in Death Stranding, your biggest fear are those bigger BTs. Well, in my personal experience anyway, I struggled with them the most, as I'm sure that many others did as well. These bigger BTs are not to be taken lightly, as if you are not paying attention or don't have enough ammo, you can be killed very easily. On your journey, you will meet a vast group of characters who all have different goals and motives throughout the story, trying to guide Sam in a way that will perhaps serve their own personal goals as well. All of the characters in Death Stranding are of great quality, with some really interesting character arcs from Dead Man to Clifford Unger, who for me completely subverted my expectations. As after all this time, he wasn't trying to steal your BB Lou, he just wanted to meet you, his son. Even all of the backstories are very interesting. Take Dead Man for instance. Yes, there are a lot of people in this game with either the word dead or die or something along those lines. Dead Man is actually someone who was created in a lab, almost Frankenstein's monster-esque, which would actually explain the giant scar across his forehead. It's such a weird concept for a character arc and only one that Hideo Kojima would put into a game. Another is Hartman, who was killed in a chiral explosion with his wife and child, but was brought back to life from the dead. He now spends most of his days inducing death to search for his family on a beach, and then reviving himself through electric shock. Again, such an intricate backstory. Finally, we have one of the deepest characters in the game, that being Fragile. Fragile's backstory is the darkest of all, and it involves one of the game's antagonists, that being Higgs. Fragile's family owned a delivery company, and it seems like delivery companies are everywhere in this universe. And when Higgs and Fragile partnered up, eventually Higgs joined Armalee. Higgs became a terrorist and forced Fragile to either let a bomb blow up in a city, which would ruin the reputation of her family's legacy, or throw the bomb away with nothing but her underwear on. And this would be leaving her open to being aged by the time full reign, but as the noble person that Fragile is, she sacrificed her body's youthfulness for the safety of the city. I know that that was a lot to take in, but this just shows how much time and dedication was put into fleshing out each and every character's aspects of their backstory. Hideo Kojima really did do a stellar job with the characters in Death Stranding, as that is one of the main reasons I love this game so much. After the events of the main campaign, you are placed into chapter 15 of the game, a chapter set two weeks before the ending of chapter 14, and so you are basically put back in time, meaning that the game can now go on forever. I'm not going to stay on this chapter of the video for too long, as there's not really a lot to do after the ending of the game, mainly due to the fact that the ending is set after this final chapter, which is confusing in of itself. During this final chapter 15, which is basically an excuse to keep on traversing the world after the story's end, your tasks are basically side content in the game, meaning that you will now, if you want to, be delivering more packages to more NPCs. These NPCs are not directly intertwined to the main story, however. This unfortunately left me a bit lost as to what to do, as although I enjoyed doing these deliveries when going towards a new main objective, they obviously don't hold the same weight and gravitas as the main story missions. Personally, after finishing Death Stranding, I had to take a step back from the game, as at this point I had been playing Death Stranding every day for a good couple of hours, so perhaps it could be fatigue, but after concluding the campaign, I felt like my time with the game was done. 
And I'm not too sure if these side quests are generated randomly and therefore some of the NPCs are just reused or there is an actual limit. Unfortunately, this is where I left off my experience with Death Stranding, apart from getting a few new cinematic shots for this video, which was oddly nostalgic. Especially considering I only finished the game in April of 2020, but it did feel like I was at home back in the world of Death Stranding. Music can play a big role in any form of media, whether that be radio, television, film, and also video games. Death Stranding's approach to music is very scarce, but yet very powerful. I generally noticed it when meeting new characters or in key moments of the game. These songs would play when you hit a trigger point or a certain distance before an objective. Hearing those songs by Low Roar, Churches, and many others, but those are my personal favourite artists from Death Stranding, and their songs were so impactful that I would often stop just before a mission objective, because getting too close to an objective would stop the song, and get out of my vehicle and then stare into the in-game surroundings whilst listening to these powerful songs. These musical moments when traversing Death Stranding's phenomenal open world for me, for me, were some of the best moments in the game. But one of the most powerful moments in the game for me, and perhaps in my gaming career, if you can call it that, was the song Bones, played by Low Raw. It really hit me in the heart, and I'm not being dramatic, I am wholeheartedly being honest. I would say that this specific moment to me is comparable to Arthur Morgan's death in Red Dead Redemption 2, and the giraffe scene in The Last of Us. All of these moments we treasure and have a real connection to, and I really felt quite emotional when Bones played, perhaps due to the fact that I was so immersed in the world and its characters, and therefore I empathised with the struggles of each of the characters, and these moments really expressed this feeling through perfectly chosen music. Multiplayer is a fairly big feature of the game, and yet it can be avoided entirely. Death Stranding's multiplayer isn't exactly how you would normally perceive multiplayer with cooperation to be. Instead of being directly with other players, it's more indirect. The way that you interact with players is not your standard multiplayer, but you do interact with players to a certain degree. When you start the game, specifically when you're going to your first main mission, that being going to the crematorium, you may already see ladders or bridges that can guide you over certain obstacles. This is not a part of the main game, instead those are placed by other players. You yourself can even place ladders over a lake, and as long as another player is connected to the internet when playing, they can use your ladder and give it a like. This may sound very minimal to the game, but it really does make a big impact, more than you realise anyway. Using these user-created pathways can stop you from having to use your own resources to build a path yourself, and so it can really come in handy. Another part of the multiplayer mainly consists of side quest objectives. If you pick up a delivery but realise you don't want to do it, you can place the parcel in a post box and another player can pick up the package and do the delivery for you. Although Death Stranding's multiplayer may seem minimalistic in comparison to other games, it is still just as integral to the experience. Although if you don't have an internet connection, the only disadvantage is that you may need to build a pathway yourself, or scale a mountain without the rope of another player. But realistically, it doesn't matter, as either way you can still progress through the game without player's help, it just may take a little bit extra time. Death Stranding does not only take Sam Porter on a journey, but the player as well. So much of Death Stranding connected with me on an emotional level, as certain moments in the game ended up leaving me speechless, severely shocked, or anxious to know more. I feel like only a certain few games have personally left me in one of these three states. I honestly love every part of this game. The story, which was told beautifully, the world design, and the characters. It's one of the few times a game will really be with me for the rest of my life, and one that I will certainly never forget. I was always quite interested in Death Stranding, and I'm not too sure why. Since Death Stranding is quite an artistic game, and me being a university film student, I deeply appreciated the authorship presented in Hideo Kojima's last game, and perhaps that's why it called out to me, the inner curiosity of artistic expression that Hideo Kojima presented in Death Stranding certainly caught my interest. 
The beauty of video games like Death Stranding is that they are basically interactable movies. And with Death Stranding's 11 plus hours worth of cutscenes, it really could be comparable to one. When playing, I felt like it was a movie. Even in the downtime when traversing the world, I was still just as engaged as if I was in a cutscene. And although Hideo Kojima wants to delve into film directing, I don't think the narrative would have been as strong in film form. The fact that most people outside of the video gaming bubble don't appreciate the field as having the capabilities to convey as much meaning as a film does. And it's such a shame as well, as it truly has the capacity and the ability to do so as presented in Death Stranding. It is truly a real privilege and honour to say that I well and truly loved Death Stranding, and the fact that Death Stranding has really earned my respect. As well as Hideo Kojima, as this is the first of his games that I have actually played, and I have a feeling that it certainly won't be the last. But thank you so much for watching this video, if you did enjoy then subscribe and turn on that notification button so you don't miss another upload from me. So thank you, and goodbye.